Again, I'm a, I've uh, been practicing neonatology in Western Washington for over 25 years, and uh, it's nice to be with you. I hope you can hear me now. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person. Um, I'm 12 hours behind you, so it's approaching 10 o'clock at night here, but I'm wide awake and I'm with you, and glad to be with you. So today we're going to learn why preterm babies have high risk of medical complications, the resources we need, um, how to best maintain their temperature, assist them with ventilation, how to protect their brain, and to understand the transition from fetal circulation to the new circulation. Our goals are how to manage oxygen uh, for the preterm baby, those the ways that we can decrease lung and brain damage, and special precautions we need to take after initial stabilization. First, we should, should talk about preparation. When we know a preterm birth is occurring in our, in our delivery suite, we need to make sure that the most skilled personnel are available for the complex resuscitation. Uh, during the discussion about endotracheal intubation, laryngeal mask, if the baby does need to be intubated, we have decided that the most skilled person on our team will be the one to intubate a very immature baby, your baby's less than 25 weeks. We need to have the radiant warmer in the room turned on and already heating. We, we can turn up the temperature in the delivery suite if that's possible. We should have oximeter, oxygen blender, and and uh, the guidelines suggest an EKG monitor if it's available, uh, a ventilation device that's been discussed, bag and mask, self-inflating bags are very good, but T-piece resuscitators are also uh, very good and uh, standard procedure. For uh, preterm babies, we should have at least two size ET tubes, the 2.5 and the 3.0 internal diameter, along with a working laryngoscope that someone on the team has uh, checked and make sure that it's working well. And then uh, a word about surfactant. Uh, we, could, we should have it available. It should be on the ready uh, when the patient comes to the NICU and uh, may therefore benefit from in and out surfactant treatment if it's indicated. Okay, what are uh, going on now with the high-risk features of preterm newborns? One, they have rapid heat loss. Why is that? They have thin skin. Uh, they have decreased subcutaneous fat to keep themselves warm. They have a large surface area. They're often born wet, and uh, their wet skin leads to rapid cooling and ambient air. And they have a limited way to respond metabolically to their cold environment. So they're very vulnerable and rely on us to keep them warm. Um, other high-risk features, they have weak intercostal muscles. Now, thinking about the respiratory system, weak intercostal muscles, very flexible, uh, not very ossified ribs. So they have decreased ef effect efficiency of their spontaneous breathing. Their lungs are immature, and they have either deficient or insufficient surfactant. Therefore, their lungs are less compliant. They're more difficult to ventilate in the delivery area, as well as difficult to ventilate in the NICU. And they have a greater risk because of their premature airways and premature lung tissue. They have a greater risk of injury from our positive pressure ventilation and from oxygen. Um, so again, just going over some of those key vulnerabilities of preterm babies. Their immature tissues are Im easily damaged by oxygen. Here we think of the brain, the eyes, the brain, and uh, the lungs. They have an immature immune system, which uh, allows an increased risk for them to develop sepsis or pneumonia meningitis. They have a smaller blood volume, and so they can easily um, lend themselves to hypovolemia if they have any significant amount of blood loss. And their immature skin can be easily bruised and disrupted, and that creates further complications for them. Thinking a little more about the, the high-risk vulnerability of preterm babies, their brains, one of the most essential and key organs of the body, uh, they have immature blood vessels. Their, their cerebral blood vessels are too immature to regulate uh, brain blood flow. 
when the baby's blood pressure is too high or too low. They can sustain bleeding or damage in those uh, vulnerable areas if the blood supply is insufficient or if the oxygen is insufficient. And they have limited metabolic reserves to, which increases the risk of hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia in a preterm baby is also very bad for their brains. These premature babies have low glycogen content in their muscles. They have low circulating glucose and they have an immature capacity to make new glucose. We call that gluconeogenesis. That primarily takes place in the liver and these babies have immature livers. <clears throat> so um, some of these key areas that we wanted to talk about, those vulnerable areas uh, that the babies have. The preterm baby has a very high risk of developing hypothermia. We need to prevent that heat loss by planning ahead, which we've already talked about, and then by acting. <clears throat> Things we can do, such as increase the room temperature where the baby is going to deliver. If we know uh, preterm babies are going to deliver in one of our delivery suites, one of our team will go over to that room where they're going to deliver and turn up the temperature to create a better ambient temperature around the baby. We place a hat on the baby's head. We, and if, it, if we have these available, these thermochemical mattresses, they're a single use uh, mattress that we can put under the baby. It's a chemical warming mattress. It needs to be activated before birth. The warmer needs to be turned on before birth. There are some reports, uh, and, and here's a caution about those chemical warming mattresses. We should not put the baby's skin directly against them. There should be a blanket between the baby's skin and these warming mattresses, and their temperatures need to be monitored carefully so that they don't overheat or sustain a, a thermal injury. And we, we do use those chemical warming blankets in our practice. Another thing we can do is wrap the baby in a polyethylene plastic bag or a plastic wrap if the baby is less than 32 weeks. That's uh, the recommendation from uh, the NRP program. When we do this, we, uh, we don't dry them beforehand. We leave them wet and we just cover them with the plastic or put them in one of these plastic uh, polyethylene wraps and we fully cover them from their shoulders down to their feet. Now, if um, we need access to their umbilicus, for example, to do uh, to place an umbilical catheter. We can merely create a hole in this plastic wrap and uh, insert the catheter through that hole. <clears throat> this is a another intervention that will decrease uh, the incidence of hypothermia in preterms. Here's an example with a mannequin of the kind of bag we talk about. Uh, this is a this is a common food grade uh, storage bag. A hole has been created so that the baby's head can be slipped through the hole, and then the rest of the bag is wrapped around the baby. And if need be, another hole can be created to access the umbilicus. And so the key now is to prevent cold stress after birth. That's what we've been talking about. So to prevent hypothermia, we can consider that thermal mattress I discussed. It's very important that someone anticipate and turn on the radiant warmer where the baby's going to deliver. If the baby needs to be transported in a transport incubator from the delivery suite to the NICU, then we have pre-warm transport incubators to make that movement. The goal is to maintain the baby's temperature at 36.5 to 37.5 Celsius. I'm sure that's a very uh, well understood and uh, common temperature goal in your practices. And once we've achieved that, they still need to have their temperature monitored frequently so that they, number one, don't overheat from our zealous efforts, but uh, so that they don't also become cool again or become cool if we're not monitoring their temperature. Now, leaving the concept of uh, thermal control, preventing hypothermia, we're switching to assisting breathing for the preterm newborn. And uh, there's been discussion about this uh, in a general way prior to this. And I would say to you that we use the same criteria in preterm babies as we do in term babies for starting positive pressure ventilation. If a baby is completely apneic, uh, despite the initial uh, steps, if they're gasping or if their heart rate remains less than 100 despite respiratory efforts, those are criteria to start positive pressure ventilation. 
However, if the baby's breathing spontaneously, um, we can consider you the use of CPAP uh, rather than moving to intubating a baby. And that's, uh, that's highly recommended uh, that we do that if a baby is spontaneously breathing and we can maintain their heart rate greater than 100. And if we do need to use positive pressure ventilation through either a um, laryngeal mask airway or through an endotracheal tube, we want to use in the preterm baby the lowest pressure needed to maintain the heart rate. Typically, that is a starting pressure of 20 to 25 centimeters of water. One might need to increase initially to overcome the low compliance of the preterm baby's lungs because they're often still moist and filled with fluid and surfactant deficient. But all of this, the goal of all of that is to get their heart rate and to maintain their heart rate, maintain their heart rate greater than 100. And if it's possible to use a lower pressure than the ones indicated, then by all means, we should use the lowest pressure possible. As we assist breathing for preterm newborns, um, obstruction of their airway and face mask leak are common problems. I, I heard a good discussion by one of my colleagues about this. And um, in preterm babies, even small changes in their head and neck position um, can lead to poor ventilation. And if we correct that with the necessary small changes in head and neck position, that can lead to significant improvements in ventilation. So it's the same Mr. Sopa steps that was discussed by one of my colleagues. And um, if we feel that leak around the face, and again, we should choose a small mask for the preterm baby, um, then we uh, adjust the mask by using the Mr. Sopa steps. And we must be sure that the mask is a good size that fits the baby. If it's too large, um, then it won't allow for a good seal around the baby's face. So an appropriately chosen mask is necessary. When uh, we use a positive pressure uh, ventilation device, such as a T-piece um, or uh, the, the anesthesia flow inflating bag, and um, the self-inflating bags do sometimes have the ability to add a PEEP valve, but the recommendation is that any of the devices we use, we should try to use PEEP, positive and expiratory pressure, the optimal PEEP is not known, but a good starting place is around five to six centimeters of water. When uh, we resuscitate babies less than 35 weeks, we have the ability to start with anything between 21 to 30% oxygen. I often try to begin at 21% and then move it to 30% as needed um, by using a blender and then adjust for the baby's saturations as we are monitoring saturations. And then if the baby requires intubation because they're not responding to um, stimulation, drying, mask ventilation, uh, then we can consider surfactant if they're intubated. That's usually babies less than 30 weeks gestation. It's not a component of initial resuscitation. And we, we, we in our practice wait until the baby is stabilized in the NICU. But if it's indicated we move to surfactant uh, replacement quickly. Um, <clears throat> a, a word about oxygen. And uh, we all know that even though oxygen is a medication, it's a medication that can be overused. If we administer excessive oxygen, after perfusion has been restored, and the best evidence of perfusion being restored is a rising heart rate, uh, excess oxygen can result in injury. Recall that the fetal tissues normally develop in a very low oxygen environment, and a preterm baby has less uh, protective functions, antioxidant functions from oxygen-associated injury. They're just not well yet well developed, and uh, re remain very immature. So um, they really do. Re these preterm babies rely on us to be very cautious and to monitor the oxygen supplementation very carefully with the pulse oximeter. This table um, hopefully is familiar to you. Um, it's known to you. And what this is, it's part of the neonatal resuscitation program. And it shows the um, when we put a pulse oximeter on the baby, we put it on the right hand so that we're monitoring the preductal oxygen saturation through pulse oximetry. And at one minute of life, a baby will be 60 to 65% saturated. At four minutes, then we get up to 75 to 80%. And then at five minutes, we should only expect a baby to be around 80 to 85% and so on. So this table 
we can use to guide our supplementation of oxygen. If a baby's oxygen saturations are within an appropriate uh, range for a minute of life, then uh, we don't need to be aggressive with oxygen. And as I mentioned, for preterm babies less than 35 weeks, we have the option of beginning in the range of 21 to 30 percent. Next, uh, after talking about hypothermia and respiratory support, uh, we'll talk about protecting the brain. Uh, you know, the brain is such an essential organ that we want to be as protective as we can of these premature babies and reduce their risk for CNS injury. Why are they at such risk? Well, um, their brains are very immature, like the rest of their body. They have fragile capillaries um, in the germinal matrix of the ventricles, and they're very susceptible to bleeding in these, in these uh, very fragile capillaries, especially babies less than 32 weeks, especially babies who are very immature in the 23 to 27 week range. The increase, there's an increased risk of these ruptured capillaries if there's a rapid change in, a, in blood CO2, in blood pressure, or in blood volume. And that could be a blood pressure that is uh, far too low or a blood pressure that's far too high. Um, the bleeding in the brain can cause tissue damage and therefore lifelong disability, which we want to avoid, of course. And then um, if there's inadequate blood flow or oxygen, that obviously can also cause injury. We would, we would refer to that as um, hypoxic or ischemic injury. And, um, and then finally, we know that uh, retinopathy of prematurity will be increased uh, the more that a baby is exposed to high levels of oxygen concentration, supplemental oxygen. So to decrease neurologic injury, um, it sounds obvious, but um, hopefully your nurses, like my nurses, your physicians, like our physicians, are um, routinely treating and handling these babies in a very gentle fashion. Um, we try not to handle their skin as much as we can. We just try to avoid touching them at all, if we can, for the first 72 hours. We don't position their legs higher than their head, which could increase uh, intracranial blood pressure. We avoid using excessive positive pressure ventilation or excessive CPAP. Those can interfere with venous return uh, from, the, from, the, uh, from the chest and therefore less blood flow to the brain, or it can impair venous return coming from the brain to the uh, to the chest. Um, excessive PPV or CPAP can cause pneumothorax. Um, rapid changes in CO2 also increase risk of bleeding in the brain. So again, um, another call for us to be cautious with uh, assisted ventilation if we offer it or supplemental oxygen if we offer it. Other ways to decrease neurologic injury. I've been mentioning it. We want to avoid excessive oxygen. If possible, then in the delivery room or before the baby is admitted to the NICU, the goal is, is if they are available to use oxygen blenders and to use pulse oximeters if they're available uh, to us in our, in our hospitals, in our delivery suites, in our NICUs. And then once the baby is in the unit, we use pulse oximetry and blood gases to adjust the oxygen and to adjust our ventilator support uh, as needed so that we neither overventilate the baby or underventilate the baby and so that we don't overoxygenate the baby. Also ways to reduce uh, CNS injury, any fluid or uh, flu uh, intravenous fluid or critical medications that are needed, uh, we should try not to bolus them quickly or rapidly, but if we can, to give them over five to 10 minutes. In other words, infuse them slowly so that we don't give a large volume infusion um, into, the, into the circulation and, and put the uh, germinal matrix at risk. We should definitely avoid rapid infusions by way of the umbilical arterial catheter if those are being used. And we should avoid hypertonic IV solutions uh, such as sodium bicarbonate, which has been associated with intraventricular hemorrhage. So um, once, once the babies have sustained some, some level of CNS injury, and here I'm thinking of uh, possibly intracranial hemorrhage, possibly hypoxic ischemic injury, um, which we do see in preterm babies as well as term babies, then there can be a neurologic dysfunction that ensues, 
such as sucking or oral feeding problems once the baby uh, reaches an age where we'd expect them to begin uh, having feeding um, uh, feeding skills. This can last for several days or even a week or 10 days. And so we, it's up to us then to provide nutrition by alternative, me alternative measures such as gavage feedings. And it's helpful for the babies to get their mother's milk, if at all possible, as their first feedings. And so uh, it's incumbent on our team, uh, physicians, nurses, and other specialists to help the mother with her ability to express breast milk if that's uh, you know culturally appropriate as well as expressing it and storing it. The best ways we can feed our newborns is with uh, the mother's milk or donor milk. Just a few thoughts uh, as we conclude about uh, those first minutes and hours of a baby's life and the cardiovascular function and status of the baby. Very early in their transition after birth, there can be a large drop in pulmonary vascular resistance. We, we know that that's the usual approach or the usual uh, drop in fetal uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. And it's followed by a more gradual, longer decrease as the lungs are aerated. But also uh, recognize there is a sudden crease, increase in the systemic vascular resistance following the clamping of the umbilical cord. Um, now, what can help the baby's blood flow, pulmonary blood flow, and help their preload is if we can perform delayed cord clamping and uh, that's been mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit more about it to, uh, uh, tomorrow. But if we can do delayed cord clamping and the obstetrician or whoever's delivering the baby can stimulate their breathing, that will increase pulmonary blood flow and preload. So delayed cord clamping for 30 to 60 seconds can be very favorable if the baby's status uh, is stable. And then uh, the very premature my myocardium may be unable to overcome that increase in afterload that I mentioned above following uh, the clamping of the cord. Now the baby's uh, immature fetal heart, the ventricular pumping chambers now have to uh, do all the work now that the low, uh, the low pressure placenta is gone. Okay, I think that may be my last slide. Oh, here's the last slide. Sorry about that. Okay. Lastly, um, a good resuscitation of a preterm baby will be the result of that first um, bullet point. Anticipate the delivery, plan ahead, Practice your skills and simulate difficult cases. Perform the team briefing. What that means is prior to the delivery, the team that's going to resuscitate gets together and they divide the tasks and they go over the history of the pregnancy and they decide how they're going to approach the resuscitation. They give assignments to each other. Um, the team leader typically is the physician and um, will give those assignments and also lend support to each team member. Each team member and the team as an entirety needs to be prepared with assembled supplies and all the equipment needed for that preterm birth and resuscitation. And a well-functioning resuscitation team will communicate calmly and clearly and speak out loud so that all can hear. And then uh, there's the concept of what we call a debriefing. We hold another briefing after the resuscitation and stabilization where the team can discuss the performance of the team. And, and I would say to you in practice, when we have those briefings before this, the um, resuscitation and the debriefing afterwards, uh, much is learned from those situations and I highly recommend them. So that uh, concludes my presentation. Thank you all for your attendance and your uh, attention, and it was a pleasure to be with you.